Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the conference. I'm so excited to introduce our first panel today. We have a great lineup for you. My name is Jackie Moll. I'm a first year MBA student at MIT Sloan, and I'm the student lead for the Innovators and Adopters panel. On our panelists today, we have MBA and NCAA champion and current ESPN analyst, Shane Battier. Former NBA coach and current ESPN analyst Jeff Van Gundy. The GM of the Houston Rockets, Daryl Morey. Woo! And New York Times bestselling author of Moneyball and the Blind Side, Michael Lewis. Moderating our panel today will be Jackie McMullen of ESPN. For those that would like to ask questions in the Q&A portion, please go onto the conference app to the Q&A section for the Innovators and Adopters panel. You'll be able to submit questions and vote on questions, and we'll be handing those off to Jackie for the last 15 minutes of Q&A for this hour. Thank you so much, and with that, I'll hand it over to Jackie. Thanks, everybody. Good morning. How are you doing? <coughs> this is a great panel because of how well these four gentlemen know each other and have, whose paths have crossed. Let's start with Daryl. This is his invention. It's getting bigger and Jessica. bigger. And Jessica, too, of course. Jess, stand up. Why not? Jess Gelman. She does all the work now. Daryl just gets all the accolades. Jess does all the work. You're putting so much pressure to call us a great panel already. Well, all right. Don't let me down. Okay. So let's. Uh, uh, what I'd like to start with, Daryl, is the gentleman to your right, Shane Battier, which um, you were telling me backstage may have helped you get your job or, or, or earn your reputation as the analytics guru in the NBA. <laughs> now, is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, you'll find that? out. We, we you're you're about to first? find out, Shane. You're about to find out. <laughs> Depends uh, on who you ask. <laughs> so explain a little bit to this panel um, what drew you to Shane Batty and what makes him such a unique basketball player, especially from an analytics standpoint. Well, I'd say I'm very excited for this panel. Yeah, obviously, uh, a lot of people, you know, very, you know, very uh, important to my career, like she said. Uh, you know, Shane's sort of like Luke Scott. It's his destiny to be here. Uh, we've been waiting for him to retire. Our first panelist that was ever on our posters, we, we, we illegally used your image many years ago. We're going to talk about that later, but thank you. It was, it was Shane blocking Kobe. I think that was our fourth year or something like that. So, um, no, but uh, many, many years ago when I first, uh, you know, our owner read Moneyball and was out looking for a general manager to fit that role and after interviewing many, many people and uh, finally, finally I got a chance to interview and got, got very fortunate. Our owner was very forward thinking. Uh, the very first trade we basically did was to get Shane and we had Yao Ming, we had Tracy McGrady, <coughs> Tracy McGrady at the time and we were looking for the, the perfect third guy to, to go with, with those guys and we searched uh, for a long time, and you know there was basically a guy, you know, making you know eight points a game, five rebounds a game. I don't, I don't know what the, was that about it. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> it was. Just, I remember we were giving up our first round pick, and we got killed for that trade. They're like, you're giving up a first round pick for a guy who, who you know, barely week. contributes, <laughs> and and. Uh, it was a yeah, <laughs> and I'll let Jeff jump in because Jeff was the, the coach uh, at the time. And, uh, you, you know, absolutely he was the perfect fit. So, Jeff, you wanted Shane Battier. And, th and uh, the numbers, we'll get to the numbers in a minute, but tell me what you saw in Shane that made you think, okay, this will work. Well, when you have great players like Yao and uh, Tracy, you've got to surround them with guys who... Um, can make their weaknesses less weak and their strengths even stronger. And he had everything that you could want in a, in a player. Uh, tough, smart, shot it, um, never took a possession off, all those things. And, but Daryl's right, you know, the idea that it was a no-brainer, even, even uh, Les Alexander, the owner, uh, had to be convinced because, you know, Rudy Gay had this, uh, quote, immense upside, and Stromile Swift, um, we, we, people overlooked that aspect. We got rid of his salary. Um, uh, but anyway, the bottom line is, 
when you're giving away, I think it was the eighth pick, if I'm, if I'm right, Daryl? Yeah. Eight or, yeah. Eighth pick. It's a high pick. Uh, eighth, eighth pick. <laughs> That's what and this guy who was the second pick in the draft for a guy who had um, numbers that weren't staggering. But screamed, <laughs> less than st- yeah. But screamed winner. It was. I, I don't think it was as hard for us as the perception of how the trade sure. was. So, Michael, you wrote a terrific piece in the New York Times about Shane Battier. Um, I suggest everybody it, read it. it. It was a terrific piece, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. No, it was just great. That's we're why we're just going to talk about Shane. No, no I was thinking Shane. Wait, we shouldn't let Shane talk. <laughs> we're going to. We're going to get to Shane. It started to feel like his funeral. Uh, that, that we could just we so all talk about him. It's your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's coming, right. Shane. It's coming. Don't worry. So here's. Can I explain how I got interested? Yes. So, so um, that's why you're here. Yes. Go right. I, it, it was pure literary opportunism. That when when I when I wrote Moneyball, um, you know, one of the ways I thought about it was you had this front office was was was, it, was essentially treating baseball as a science experiment, and they had these lab rats called players. Mm-hmm. And they never talked to the lab rats about what they were doing. And in fact, Billy Bean said, when I said, I, you know, I'm going to talk to him, you know, anything you want me to avoid, kind of thing, he says, he says, we never talk to him about what we're doing. It just confuses them. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it, and now there is a view um, that basically you can't be too stupid to play baseball. And there, it is true that when you wander through a baseball locker room, it is amazing what is that, what, what is, you know, the level of... Well, believe me, that's my life's you know, work. You know, no, but, but <laughs> it is, but, but, so when I started hit other sports, and I was really, football and basketball, struck by how articulate the athletes were, um, c- compared to baseball players. Uh, and, <laughs> Poor baseball. Um, well, baseball players didn't go to college, most of them. They're drafted well, it, right it, out of high there's school. There's a whole lot of reasons, but you really, you really... <laughs> It, 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 doesn't fi- it doesn't filter for intelligence at any level. There's no complexity to it. You know, you just got to, really, you have to shut your mind down and stand in an outfield uh, and, and not to be so bored that you want to quit. Uh, uh, and, but the, so I, you know, if, if you ask the, you know, the average person who the dumb jock is, they'd say a football player. But the football the players, opposite, yeah. the football players are incredibly smart. Uh, They're smarter than that. Well, they have it's to be. so complex. So anyway, so I had this experience where it, it wasn't true. It, it is possible to be very intelligent and play baseball. Um, and Scott Hatterberg, for example, was wonderfully intelligent and articulate and vaguely aware that something very weird was going on inside the Oakland A's front office and wanted to talk about it and wanted to know about it and then could then inform me about kind of what it felt like to be stuck on first base without know, knowing how to play it and why kind of they were doing it. But so anyway, cut to uh, this. And when, when I heard that Daryl would be, when I realized Daryl might be willing to let me in a bit, partly because Moneyball had had an effect on his career, and then found that he had this lab rat who actually understood the experiments as much as the, as much as the scientist. Uh, I mean, that's what intrigued me, was that I could actually talk to a player who was using the stats and, and actually deploying them in real time on the court. It was something that, I mean, it wasn't really an option in baseball, because baseball players don't have any, they don't have much discretion about what they're doing. They get told what to do. Um, another reason, you, know, you don't have to be, but, uh, uh, um, and then he was so good to talk to. I mean, he shouldn't talk now because the effect is great. But, it, but, it, but, it, but, it's, it's, uh, but he was so um, open and intelligent about it that I just thought, oh my god, this is a gold mine. It was, it, it was, uh, it, it was a wonderful piece to write. It was, it was easy. It was one of those pieces where you just thought, I just thought, I can only screw this up because the material is so good. All right, so let's like talk to the lab rat that had the good sense to wear Celtic green pants in Boston. <laughs> uh, so Shane, I'm wondering how aware were you as a basketball player of all the nuances that you were doing and their statistical effect on the game? And by that I mean tipping the ball, you know, you had this reputation for tipping the ball exactly to the right player. Um, in Michael's piece he mentions um, when, you're, when you were boxing out a, a less effective rebounder, you'd go and box out the stronger rebounder. Was this something you did instinctively or something that you knew had statistical advantages? Jackie, I, I would have loved to think that I was that sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> really, really would have. Uh, for me, like it's always been since kickball to the NBA Finals, it was about winning. 
it was about winning. Mm -hmm. you know, growing up in, in Detroit, Michigan, um, I was uh, the only minority in my, my school. Uh, on pitcher day, they gave out combs to everybody. They gave me a pick. And I just wanted to be like <laughs> everybody else. I'm like, That's why, made, why, why, That's why, made up. Why, why can't I get a, a comb like everybody else? And I'm, like I'm, I'm, yeah, I, was, I just want a comb. And so I, I was the tallest kid. I was the minority. I, I, just, I just wanted to fit in like every other kid, right? Well, there's one place I always fit in. On the kickball field, on the baseball field, on the basketball field. You know why? Because I figured out when my teams win and when I help teams win, people like me. I fit in. And it was as simple as that. It was as simple. And I took that mindset throughout my career. And it wasn't until sort of the perfect storm of, of these three gentlemen came together that, A, I was sort of validated and, and right. vindicated. And they could explain what I'd do a hell of a lot better than I could ever explain what I could do. Mm -hmm. uh, but to, to go to Houston and to have the, uh, the infrastructure. I remember the first time I read a, a scouting report from, from Daryl and his guys. And uh, th these were serious scouting reports. Normally a scouting report says, you know, well, you know Carmelo Anthony's got a really strong right hand. Uh, don't, you know, look out for him on the, on the left block. He's pretty good down there. It's like, yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're, but we're you, were the only, you were the only person getting these scouting reports, though, right? He was the only player well, that, you were That was before I got to Houston. And then all of a sudden, I get, to, I get to Houston, and literally, we get a page and a half scouting report with the fonts about this big on every guy. And they were able, for really, for the first time, drill down exactly who a player was. They could deconstruct a player to a percentage. And for me, it, it just made sense. I said, okay, well, if Carmelo is is 10% less efficient going to his right than his left, which is true, why wouldn't I take those 10%, that, 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 those 10 points right there? And so for the first time, it was like someone was speaking my language in, in the game of basketball. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and to play for a coach like Jeff, the first coach who talked in those terms, that it wasn't just about heart and desire and grit. No, there's an intelligence level that you must approach the game with to have ultimate success. You can play hard and you can play together and play smart, yada, 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 all, the, all that good stuff, all the kumbaya stuff. But if you don't approach <laughs> it with a certain intelligence, you'll never reach the next level. So Jeff um, taught me, the most important thing you ever taught me and it was your mantra every single day was two point jumpers do not beat us. Two point contested, two point dribble jumpers don't beat us. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's a, as, a co as a player, you know how liberating that is to hear that from a coach? To say, you know what, if he makes this two point dribble to contest a jumper, it's on me. It's on me. And as a defender, it's like, all right, it's on you. And you don't get caught up in the box score. You don't get caught up in the numbers, per se, because it's OK. I'm not going to get yelled at if, if Kobe hits a two-point dribble jumper in, in my face. And he explained why that was best for our team. And that right there took me to a higher level as a defender and, and as a thinker. And, and Michael, um, you know, I, I think I owe Michael 5% on every speech I give from here on in, because <laughs> um, he was able to explain what I was able to do on the teams that I played on way better than I could ever explain. Uh, but it it's was actually not true because everything I wrote, you told me. Well, <laughs> so, right. so. you made it sound a lot cooler than it actually is. <laughs> and really for the first time talking to you, I never really thought about the nuance of the game and the nuance of affecting teams. And uh, like you talked about before the show, that's a seminal message, not just for basketball, but for people, for people, every walk of life, I walk down the street and people say, hey, I read the Michael Lewis New York Times piece and it spoke to me because I think I'm that person at my elementary school. I'm undervalued. I work my tail off for the health and vitality of the team, uh, but I don't get, the, don't get the credit. But after reading your article, it spoke to me and I, and I appreciate it. And so uh, the beauty of that article, it's not just about Garden Kobe Bryant. It, it, it's really a coming-of-age story. It's, it's a story about people and value and what you can do to help a team.
it's, it's, it's also, the, the story is a story about how people are incentivized not to help their team that, that, um, because they, they aren't being measured properly. Yeah. So it takes a certain character trait to ignore the incentives in order to do the, what I like, you know, Daryl had one little, the, the one, one little spot on your record that I thought was great, it humanized you for me, was Daryl said, um, watch him, Shane will never take a half court shot at the end of half <laughs> because he knows it will reduce his, 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 his shooting percentage. <laughs> it was the one thing you did that wasn't the in the interest of your team. And I thought, well, that, 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 this guy's real. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you, but that you had figured out that you had resisted the impulse for a whole bunch of reasons, I think. That, that you resisted the impulse to maximize the things that were in your selfish interest and instead maximize the things in the team interest. I think that was what resonated with people because when people generally, when they're on teams, they want to help their instinct, their emotional, moral, ethical instinct is to help the team, right? But if then you have these different like incentives to tell that, that they're guiding you to do things that are actually not in the interest of the team, but are in your interest, uh, there's a little war inside you. And I think everybody in every organization feels that. Certainly everybody on Wall Street feels it. Uh, but everyone on, uh, in every organization feels that. And I think that's partly what resonated with people. Shane, let's talk a little bit about your numbers, because they're interesting. So um, actually, Daryl gave me some great uh, insight off stage before we came out. For your career, guess who you, whose shots did you block the most in your career? Of all the players you got, um, take a guess. Either Carmelo or Kobe. You're right, Kobe one, Carmelo Anthony two. So we were talking about Carmelo Anthony <laughs> as the, as the anti-Shane Battier because he is widely viewed as one of the most selfish players in basketball. Most steals in your career. Can I up in on that? Who I'll do you want to add? take him on my team. Of course you Kobe. will. Kobe. Of course you will. Bring that selfish guy on my team. No, no, Carmelo Anthony. <laughs> Carmelo I'll sign Anthony. up for that. You take oh, Carmelo. Carmelo, yeah, two, not Kobe. Two. Yeah, Carmelo. Yeah. Um, what team are you forming? Most <laughs> a winning one. <laughs> no, I was asking. An expensive one too. Uh, most most steals against Carmelo Anthony. You drew the most offensive fouls in your career against Carmelo, Carmelo. Anthony. But uh, here are the numbers that I want to um, talk about with you, if I can. So there's different measurements, as you guys all know, if you're interested in analytics. There's um, points per possession, there's player efficiency ratings. So player efficiency rating is not a kind number to you, and you know no, this. No, it's not. So um, we need, I want to. We, we need to work on that. All right, I know there's some smart people here. <laughs> let's, let's find let's a way to make that better way to make The Shane uh, adjustment. Right. Yeah, let's, let's so, adjust a little bit, guys. That, that's our challenge for this weekend. Actually, I have a story on that. So I, I, one, one, uh, one place I went to, they, they were taking PER, and they were like, we, but we think there's, they were onto something. They were like, we think there are these guys like Shane that they're good and coaches just play them. So we just, we just take minutes and we just give them bonus points. <laughs> bonus, Shane, Battier bonus yeah, points. Yeah, Shane bonus, bonus points, points. <laughs> yeah. So we're and doing... it actually made sense. I mean, like there's better things you can do, but that, that was, that was their way of, something that here. was a nod to coaches, Jeff. They were like, if a coach is playing them, he must be good. So, and Jeff, I want to say, was ahead of his time. You were talking about the two-point jumpers. So if you go back, and you go back and look, and, and, and Stan got six million a year, so I'm going to try and help Jeff out here. Um, if you go back to 95, and you, and you look at the coaches, Jeff's the number one defensive coach that's coached since, since they have really good data, since 95, on defense. Um, he also had the oldest teams. So yeah, you, you averaged 30 years old. Over there, Jeff. So. And we, won't, we won't talk about what wow. your offensive numbers were, Jeff, because we. Well, because you get kept it. getting Charles Oakley. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Shane, I want to get back Sorry, to Sorry, I, I took so, this off. Wow. I want to take 2012 um, 2013, you're yep. with the Miami Heat. Yep. You have a pretty good roster yep, that you're being on. So your, <laughs> your per was 10.7, and just for, I'm sure most of you know, but the league average is 15, okay? So way below the average. However, you shot 43% from the three-point line and 42% overall, which is what, okay, <laughs> give you an idea. The three-point shot is the most valuable shot. But here's the number. Your PPP, points per possession, was 1.132. That was in the 99 percentile of the league, which means you were probably the most efficient basketball player in the NBA that year. 
So that gives you an idea, I think, of what we're talking about in terms of Shane's unusual statistics and characteristics, if well, you will. Well, the funny thing about that year, um, I, I, I became the de facto power forward after Chris Bosch gets right. hurt against the uh, Indiana Pacers in the, uh, the playoffs the year before. Right. Uh, shoot the ball well, as a stretch four. So congratulations, I win the starting power forward job <laughs> uh, for the Miami Heat in the 2013 series. Before the, before the year, uh, Coach Spolstra came up to me and said, hey Shane, I don't want you to dribble. <laughs> I don't want you to post up. I don't want you to offensive rebound. I don't want you to do anything but literally catch and shoot or catch and pass. I said, you know what, I can do that. <laughs> that that's a real conversation that we had. And so literally my only job was to get out of LeBron, Dwayne, and Chris Bosh's way <laughs> and make an open shot, all right? And uh, when you simplify your job description, you know, a, a trained SEAL could do that. Uh, and so as a result, my, my, my PER was, was, my PER was a little bit down, but, um, what I did, I, I was able to create space for those players. And that's, that's what every coach is trying to do. When you have supremely talented players, when you have talent, you must allow them to operate in space. And so when you have space creators, which basically that was my main job, even though I didn't do anything on paper, my job was essential because that foot of space I was creating for LeBron James on a drive was the difference between him completing the play and him getting stopped. And uh, it's, it's a nuanced part of running offense and, and basketball theory, but it's essential. And I, I think you see it now with the great offenses in the NBA. They're, they're talking more about spacing. The, 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 you know, the Spurs traditionally, the Hawks, the Warriors have the best spacing in, in the league right now. Uh, the Phoenix Suns, it's all, it's all predicated on space, not so much the movement or, or the talent, space. So I wanna bring up a, another player we're gonna talk about just, I think we've identified you as the classic undervalued player, which is what every GM is trying to sign to their team. Until the article came out. And after yeah. that, yeah. right? I mean, no, it's interesting how until you until metrics started to come into the sport. And I, what I wonder a bit is, did you feel at the end overvalued? Did, did, because <laughs> because yeah. because this yeah. is crazy now, did. right? I yeah. did because I didn't play for the fame or the glory. I, I yeah. played to win, yeah. and I and I played to do the things that would keep me on the on the court especially during crunch time. That was, that was my only goal. And so all of a sudden, I had all these people talking about me. It was, it was a, little, a little embarrassing, to be honest with you. And, but, in the, and the mar but the market for your services changed, right? Yes. There, I mean, isn't that right? I mean, the, the, you, you, all of a sudden, there are people like Daryl who are, who are valuing what you can do properly, and they're competing with each other for you. Uh, did you. Did you feel that? Sorry, um, I, I shouldn't be asking. Right. You really I, wanted to be this moderator. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did, but it felt good to be valued, and that's all. That's what I was trying to do. I was trying to add value to a team, and but it's, hey, it's always nice to be appreciated. You know, I'm, I'm not a to the point where you I'm didn't have to retire. Like, we tried to talk him into playing like <laughs> ten times. It's like, so you were. You must, we must not have been the only team trying to talk you out of retirement. I, I had a few overtures. Yeah, I had a few overtures. I think the flip side of it, though, was for a lot of. NBA, casual NBA fans, they got really mad. Yeah. They got really mad. They, yeah. My son's one of them. Yeah. He, I mean, I, I love you, Shane, you know that. My son hated you. Yeah. What do you mean he can guard Kobe Bryant? That's nonsense. He can't guard Kobe Bryant. Who says he can guard Kobe Bryant? I said, well, and I showed him the numbers. Because when you guarded Kobe Bryant, his numbers went down. They were almost better keeping Kobe Bryant off the floor when you were guarding him. But I think for laymen, that was really hard to understand. Well, it's my experience, it's about bucking the narrative. People get really mad. They when do. You, when, you, when you buck the narrative, especially in sports. Everyone wants their, their star athletes to be Michael Jordan, just good looking, alpha male, killer attitude. And when you're, when you're smiling and you're playful and you're like a LeBron James who is a genius in a, in a different way, people don't like that. People flip out. Say, no, you gotta be like Michael Jordan. And then when the next superstar comes around, 
who's not like LeBron, they'll say, you know what, no, you've got to be more playful and, and more encompassing <laughs> like LeBron James. It's the narrative. And for me, the narrative is I'm a, I'm a slow dude who speaks well from the suburbs. There's no way he should be able to play 13 years in the NBA. What? He can, he can, he can be on the court with Kobe Bryant? No way. And where I felt that the most was on the court. The looks of disdain <laughs> sure. that I got from Carmelo Anthony every time we went to the jump ball circle. And it got to a point where I didn't even try to shake his hand anymore because I didn't want to see the look of just like, this guy again? Are you serious? <laughs> this guy's on me again? And it became almost comical. And it, it you know, kind of emboldened me to, to be a jerk a little bit on the court. But, um, the looks of disdain, I'll never forget, and uh, it made me feel good because I knew I was doing something that those guys couldn't explain. Uh, but that was a really <laughs> funny part. Co Kobe and, and Carmelo right. lead, lead the, the list of looks of disdain. <laughs> so so Daryl was kind enough to provide me with the players that you had the least amount of success Ooh. with. Ooh. Um, and actually, Kobe was one of them, but the Kobe numbers are... because he's so good. You know, he's yeah. just so incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So I wonder, there's, there's three other names on this list. Um, I bet you can come up with two of them. There's one that's a little bit of an outlier. Uh, Kevin Durant. Yeah. Good luck to everybody good with luck. that. Good luck. Um, Godspeed. Dirk Nowitzki. Yeah. Okay. And here's, here's the outlier. Jason Richardson. You know, he did go ahead of me in the draft. All right. That he, went, he went fifth. Okay. I went sixth in the 2001 draft, so that's explainable. Okay, good. I know he had guessed, though, Steven Jackson. Really? He killed you, remember? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I do want to bring up another player uh, that I thought was interesting from an analytics standpoint, and I'm going to ask Jeff and Daryl to get involved with this. Uh, Josh Smith, who was playing for Jeff's brother in Detroit and absolutely killing them. Um, he was the franchise player making a tremendous amount of money, one of the, just the most horrendous three-point shooters I've ever seen in my life in terms of selection, <laughs> shot selection. Well, and his, um, he was in the bottom 10% of the league in points per possession. Um, his PR was 14.2. Uh, really didn't fit what anything that Stan was trying to do and made too much money and too, too much pressure on him. And Stan made the most incredible decision to cut him loose. And people across the league were going, this can't be true. This isn't really happening. And it has totally galvanized the Detroit Pistons. Now Josh Smith is available, suddenly, I would argue, as an undervalued player. Because now you're going to get him for a minimum salary. So guess who Too signed bad. him? Guess who signed him? Daryl Morey. Your numbers, Daryl, just from what I can see. Um, minutes are down a little. He's shooting more threes in Houston than he was in Detroit. He's our best three-point shooter. Best right three-point yeah. shooter right now. We knew that. So <laughs> I wouldn't get carried away. <laughs> but explain, if you can, from an analytic standpoint, why he made sense for your team and, and didn't make sense for Detroit. Um, well, for us, it was we were trying to get him when we first added Dwight Howard. We we've always admired his game. He's a the lead defender um, he is. and we always and he's very I mean he's extraordinarily talented um, we always felt like if we got Josh in Houston and were able to play him within the structure that coach McHale has put together that he would be effective and you know so far now you don't really know like if we had signed him maybe do a big deal we had to do it as a sign and trade we could never work it out right. but if we had signed him to a big deal would it be different I mean we got him I think it's, it's a very humbling thing to get waved by a Van Gundy. <laughs> you know, they, 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 they sort of, they enjoy the process a little bit too much. <laughs> um, and so I think we got him at a great time where he, <clears throat> he you know, he wanted to be on a winning team. Uh, they were struggling in Detroit. And, uh, you know, he was open to what Coach McHale was saying. Like, hey, we need to do... It wasn't quite as blunt as Coach Spolster's talk to, to Shane, which you weren't insulted by that? I wouldn't see you as being a little insulted by that. Well, we, we called it getting spode. <laughs> That's great. We'll have to hear more of it. I got spode. You got spode, yeah. <laughs> he, he just broke it down. 
So <clears throat> Coach McHale is not that blunt. You know, he was like, hey, we want to use your talents. And this is a guy who's maybe been a little bit humbled. So we're tr building them up like, hey, we think you can really contribute. We, and so far, obviously, he's played great for us. He has. You know, he said, hey, just do what you do on defense. Uh, we're going to need you here and there on offense. You know, here's where you can really help our offense. And, you know, specifically, I'll mention one. I mean, right now, the only way to stop James Harden is to double him. So on every pick and roll, pretty, pretty, all, you know, pretty much teams are just bringing two. Uh, so, you know, it's pretty hard to beat a double team no matter how good you are. Uh, so he's got to pass the ball to the big, setting the screen. Josh is unbelievable getting that ball, attacking the hoop, and he can make all the passes. And then the reality is he's getting very good open looks, catch and shoot threes, and he's making them. So it's been great for us. Jeff, I wonder if just give us, take us a little inside um, when you're talking to Stan and he says, I'm getting rid of him. And it was the right thing for your, it just as it was the right thing for his, for Daryl's team to sign Josh, it was the right thing clearly for Detroit to move on from Josh. Yeah, they played a lot better. Um, I think to me, it's one thing for uh, Stan to have come to that conclusion, but it, it goes to ownerships. Um, Tom Gore is the owner of the Pistons, giving him the green light. To me, he's the most important person uh, in their turnaround in Detroit because, let's face it, it, it was, if it's happened before it, a releasing of that much money in the NBA, I, I don't remember it. And so I give uh, Tom Gore's uh, and Stan, Stan has steel balls. I mean, that guy, he, he, <laughs> he like just doesn't like, He's, he just does what he thinks is right and uh, speaks his mind, as everybody probably knows. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, th it's unquestioning that they're playing a lot better for a lot of reasons, though. It's not just Josh Smith. I think, you know, they've made some other changes to get more shooting on the floor. Um, they've done a good job in – because Smith uh, – and what's your term, Daryl? What's that mathematical term? Regression to the mean? It's coming to Houston, okay, with Josh's, oh. Josh's three-point shot. Uh, I don't know when, but it's coming. No, no, here's um, how it works. He's yeah. shooting 29%, so he's regressing up. Up, okay, because yeah, I, I, so. I don't know what that really means. Uh, but, but anyway, the point is, is they've gotten a lot more uh, shooting on the floor, and, um, and then the minute distribution is much different, too. So, I, listen. Sometimes everybody says the best trade in, in any sport is when both teams benefit. And right. unquestionably, in this tr waving of uh, Smith and the picking up of Smith, it was great for the, both teams and for the player, Josh, in that he got in a better role. He was the franchise player in Detroit, and he's uh, an off-the-bench player in Houston. It's perfect. Yeah. Well, don't you think, too, having, it gave more minutes for Monroe that he wasn't going to get otherwise until Josh Monroe yeah. and Drummond and, Drummond, yeah. and uh, Anthony Tolliver. You know, sure. again, they, they now added, as Shane was talking, uh, another guy to space the floor uh, so that their best players had more room to operate. And that's why I, I'm not sure how PER works in, in this way. If you're not shooting the ball, mm -hmm. Um, it hurts you. It, it hurts, hurts you. it. Sure it yeah. And it's helping, but there should be, a, it's hurting your PER, but it's helping others' PER yeah. because there's yes. more space on the floor. And so that one, that PER stuff, it's a little bit, uh, it can be misleading for the role players. So I'm curious to hear your, all of your thoughts on um, real plus minus. So you guys, if you look at a box score in the morning, you see the plus minus. Um, I think it's the most ridiculous stat in basketball right now when you just do strictly plus minus because it doesn't take into account yeah, doesn't who you're on the floor with, who are you guarding when you're on the floor, all of those things. So there is this, this statistic now called real plus minus that takes all those things into account. So I just looked it up. I was curious to see who would be leading in real plus minus. Um, it's the usual suspects for the most part. Steph Curry's number one, James Harden's number two, so Westbrook is number three. It's wrong by one. Yeah, so. It's okay. Yeah. I might not be James up James is one. And Stuff, uh, stuff is two. Um, I, don't, I, don't, no, I don't think you have updated <laughs> stats. But we'll, uh, Anthony Davis is four. LeBron James is five. But here's number six, and this I thought was worth some conversation. How many people in this room know all about Chris Middleton? 
If I asked you, could you tell me where he played and how? Okay, good. A few of you, not a lot <laughs> could you of spell, you. Spell his name. I can. That's spell right. First name. <laughs> it's got an H in it. That's a hint. Um, so his real plus minus is six point one three. Uh, not surprisingly, his offensive plus minus is is modest, but he does gets it done on the defensive end of the floor. Well, he's more of an offensive player, actually. Well, not according to these numbers. Yeah. No. So do you, do, do you not buy? Do you buy? So I guess that's my question. I've got real plus minus. Then I looked up his per, just again to get a, an idea of these numbers and how much you think they're accurate. He's um, no, nowhere near the top twenty in per. His ninety uh, fifth in the league. So he's the per. new Shane, is what you're saying. Well, that's what I'm getting at. New yeah. Shane. So he's. I do believe he's going to be a free agent, right? I think that's restricted. So I, I guess my question is, could Chris Middleton be the next Shane Battier? Well, you, you, you brought that up, and it made me think of actually one of my early meetings with Coach Van Gundy. Um, we were showing him some of the information, and to Jeff's credit, he was very much like, yeah, give me more information. I'm ready. And, um, and one of the things we showed him, I don't know if you remember this, Jeff, basically showed that, that the Kembe Mutombo was better than Yao Ming. And... Jeff correctly called me out, and I was like, well, shows he's better, but, you know, we, we're going to play Yao. Yeah. And he was like, well, you either believe this shit or you don't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, do you I remember think, that? Yeah, I think the other part of that was uh, it said we were better with Yao playing all 48 minutes yeah. just before Matumbo, like, and now you would be taken out and publicly beaten <laughs> yeah. if you played like somebody Thibodeau over, gets, yeah. yeah, oh no, he's playing, what, yeah. 40 minutes in a game, yeah, so. So Jeff was smart, yeah, so first this to Kimbe, then we got to talk about this, yeah. So I said, yeah, no, we're going to play, we got to play Yao Ming, and, but he was like, I, you know, you either believe this or not, and it was interesting, we, we had our winning streak, this was after, after Jeff left. Um, <laughs> And uh, <laughs> about, tw about 12 games in, Yao goes down, Dikembe comes in, and we're better. We were better when, and I'm not saying he's better, but, but it, was, it was interesting. But, but so you're not saying he's better, but the numbers suggest something. You know, yeah. our defense, like the game after Yao went out, we played the Wizards, and we, they scored like 68. I mean, like Dikembe was so ridiculous. He played with a chink. He was so ridiculous on defense that... I think you know. Actually, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I think he's up for it, and you know, he he was he was he was unbelievable. But Jeff was smart. He's there's a lot of really good coaches now. I think Coach Spolster, like he was asking us early. This was 2006, 2007. He was like, "Hey, you know, Yao Ming is good. You know, when should we take him out?" So, crunch the numbers, look at the study. We're like, "Well, you should never take him out." <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, again, we're not recommending that. But we were like, a tired Yao is better than anything we have, was sort of our, was our, was our analysis. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I hope Yao is remembered the way he should be in, the, in basketball history, because I think people have already forgotten about him. I often actually. think with Dwight out, we'd be better with Yao Ming right now. Yeah, or Hakeem. So. Yeah. So. yeah, Hakeem's always nice to have. Yeah. So, Michael, you've, you've done Moneyball. You've done the blind side. You've, you've, you don't have to incorporate me. I would like to. <laughs> I, I'm happy I to be like the Shane Battier of this panel. You know what? I think, I think you're I'm, kind I'm of funny. I'm out creating space for everybody else. <laughs> you throw it to me, I'll shoot it or pass it. <laughs> well, at least I have you catch and shoot a few, Michael. I was just thinking, I was just thinking when, you were, when you were talking about Dikembe, he was there when I wrote the piece. And I remember Daryl saying, we were watching the game together, and Dikembe blocked the shot and then did the finger wag, remember? And then got the, and it drove you crazy that he had to do his finger wag <laughs> before, before he, he started the fast breaks. <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and I was thinking how much better he'd have been if he didn't, if he didn't have the finger yeah, wag. Yeah, but then he wouldn't have the Geico commercial, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But I do really want to ask you, Analytics in baseball seems to always have been the, the gold standard, that it makes the most difference in baseball. And I, you've, done, you've handled baseball, you've done the blind side, you've, you've obviously had some history here in the NBA. Do you really think that's true, or do you think there's a place for analytics in all the sports? It's, it's, it's so much easier to assign credit and blame on a baseball field than in any other sport. It's basically a series of individual encounters. Right. Um, so, uh, so it's cleaner in baseball, and it's, it's, 
so, and more easily, quickly applied. But that, mean, that just means that there's more opportunity in the other sports because it's harder to do. I mean, I think that, that you know, Bill James said to me when I was working on Moneyball, um, and it seemed to me that sort of the secrets of the sport had been, had been revealed by Bill James and his ilk, that, and that they're, and they'd been at it for two decades by the time I got to them. He, he pointed to a picture of a baseball field and he said, you know what that is? That's a field of ignorance. He says, what we know is so much, what, is so much less than what we will know one day. That, like, there's so much we do not understand about the game even now. But if it's, and if it's true about baseball, it's like 10 times true about basketball and football. I mean, they're just so much more complicated. And that's why, you know, when you get a coach who's a really good coach and really knows the game, and you're an analytics minded GM, you're, the conversation, so if you take the Oakland A's front office and the conversations they would have with a typical baseball manager, the baseball manager is almost always wrong in those conversations. He has some old school idea and it is actually wrong um, because the analytics is, are really clean. The, the, and there may be something he knows sometimes, like a player is injured or you know, going through some trauma. Or he knows something, uh, that he has some piece of information that the front office doesn't have. But if there's a conversation between a basketball coach and the front office, an argument about, I would, I would say, put my money maybe on the coach. Uh, that, that, there's a, he, that he probably knows things intuitively, uh, if he's really good, that the analytics haven't figured out quite yet. Um, that's why it went better. I mean, like, because we would meet with Coach Van Gundy, you know, Jim O'Brien before that, Doc Rivers, and then Rick Adel, and like a lot of the stuff agrees with the coaches. Says Shane's good, and they're like, I always thought Shane was good. Why? <laughs> like, I can never, I can never say why. And one thing that was interesting with with Jeff was when it didn't agree with what Jeff thought. So Jeff was never did the two for one. Like, it made no sense whatsoever. Um, and so I was basically like, <laughs> like, why? Why are we not, why are we not doing this? I, you know, there's 100,000 trials, and it doesn't matter who's on the floor, it doesn't matter the context, two bad shots better than one good shot, always. Like, there's like almost no exception. Why aren't you doing this? But Jeff, of course, is pretty smart. So he said, okay, if I do that two for one thing, every time instead of not, how much more are we going to win? I was like, oh, well, that's a good question. So we go back <laughs> and we look. I was like, we'll win one more game every two years. <laughs> and he was like, he was like, well, I'm not doing that. I don't care. <laughs> that's great. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do. Yeah. So, so it, 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 no, but you know the good thing about, like, uh, when Daryl came in, you know, like, it was, you know, people like now just accept that it happened. Like, I remember our owner at this uh, one of these charity functions coming up to me and say, uh, "We're hiring uh, Daryl Morey to be a assistant general manager for a year, and then is going to take over." Uh, and I was like, curious, like, you know, who is this? And he works for the Celtics, and so many people like like so when he came in. Um, and I think this is where uh, analytics gets a little um, confused. It's, it's not what you know, it's what you can impart on people like coaches that they'll believe in it so that then they will then give it to their team. So it's, you have to have people skills, you have to have, like you have to be able to argue back and forth. It's not like you just come in and just, you know, put something on somebody's desk and all of a sudden he's gonna believe it. So I think, What's been undersold about all this is not, you know, this term. It's trying to analyze and make the best decision for the team. And what he did was he made me as a coach, if I disagreed with him for something like this two for one, you have to sit back when the numbers say, hey, I sh you should do it. It makes you think, well, if the numbers say it and I'm not doing it, why am I not doing it? And then try to come to some reasonable explanation. And oftentimes, even on that one, you know, like Michael was saying, if you're wrong, you have to say, you have to be open enough to say, I'm wrong and I'm gonna change. And so I, I've always found it, I, I don't understand even the debate about whether you should use numbers or not. What do you I, remember I changing? Huh? What did you change? 
<laughs> oh, three, uh, how much you helped defensively, like where you helped from. You know, like when I was in New York, the three-point line was, was obviously open. But the corner three, we never like, and we helped with the first man, any dribble penetration. We helped with the first man no matter if it was off the corner or not. And then as the three-point shot became more and more of an instrument, we used it more, but also we tried to defend it better. Well, and I remember when we were there, Phoenix and Coach D'Antoni is next here, had our number. I mean, they blitzkrieged us. Do you remember this, Jeff? <laughs> Like, uh, vaguely, <laughs> yeah. I think Mike used to I sit mean, out there and just name his number. All right, it's going to be 30 tonight and, you know, 40 tomorrow. But when you, you remember Rondo on the bench frustrated with Dallas recently? He had the towel over his head. If you could have put a towel over your head and, and curled up under your bench playing Phoenix that year, you would have done it, right? I mean, and so he revolutionized. You know, uh, they the were NBA. designed to beat your defense, basically. And All right, so it's, it's, not we're only, gonna, it's not only from GMs to coaches, it's coaches to players. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of yeah. the last frontier of, of, of analytics. How do you disseminate the information to the players? Because yeah. um, playing an NBA game is tough enough. You know, try to remember percentages. In, well, uh, in like, a split and I'll second. say this like, you're going to talk to him much differently than you would talk to some other knuckleheads. You know, like, so <laughs> some guys you just say, you know, like you were saying, wait for him on the, he, might, he likes that left block. That's about, you know, that's that's, 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 good. Yeah, that's, that's some it. that's a that's a great start, right? You say, hey, yes. knucklehead, he's coming <laughs> to the left block. You know, <laughs> take it away. You know, but I mean, I'm just saying, you can't treat every yeah. player the same in any situation, let alone the amount of information you yeah. give them. You can't treat every. How many other players got it over your career that you tried? I know you tried to teach them. <sighs> yeah, varying levels, varying levels. A guy like LeBron, um, who's got probably the best basketball mind I've played with outside of uh, you know, Tracy. Tracy, and, Yow or Tracy and, and LeBron, two best basketball Tracy minds. Tracy McGrady, really. Yeah. Oh, he's so very now smart. that surprises yeah. smart. me. Um, That's very smart. Smart. You had to give them a baby spoon of the, of the, of the data. And they taste it and say, you know, it's not bad. What, what else you got? Like, like every other player, you mm -hmm. know? And, and I wouldn't come and say, hey, 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 hey. You, know. you didn't spoil them. No, I didn't spoil. Hey, you can't, you can't play Kevin Durant that way. You, you got to play him this way. Right. You go, hey, hey, LeBron. In the post, KD's going over his right shoulder. Just FYI. <laughs> and he would have some success, and, and you'd see him a little more open to the information that you're able to give. And all of a sudden, once, it's, it's like a drug. Once you get hooked on that, 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 that right. number drug, you want more. You want more. And so um, I got my packet when I first got to the Miami Heat, because the, the data wasn't as readily available. My, my man, uh, Brian Hecker here, helped me, helped me out with that. But by the end of my tenure in Miami, we had six, seven, eight guys reading, reading the numbers. Um, and they all took it in a different way. But it, it, uh, once players realized, look, I can gain an edge yeah. with this, it's amazing how open they'll, they'll, they'll be. And Riley created his own, didn't he? He created his own criteria. Doesn't he have his own sort of um, well, if, if it's up body to Pat, fat? If, if, body if, it's fat. Up, if it's up to Pat Riley, it's about growth mindset. It's about ownership. It's about right. championship professionalism. It's about hunger game mentality. And being Number on schmumbers. I've, I've had more great conversations with Pat Riley about analytics versus heart. It's, it's, one of my most favorite and, people and, of all time. And here's yeah. the thing, you can do both. Yes, yeah. exactly. That's, that's exactly. the thing, it's not one or the exactly. other. Yeah. All right. they, I'm, cur I'm just curious, did they give you the same information that Daryl gave you? Um, I was able to ask specific things that I got from Daryl in Miami, and then we'd sort of figure out a way to get the information. Well, it, wasn't, it wasn't the same exact information, but I got what I needed. needed. I got my drug. <laughs> All right. I got my drug. All right, we're going to take some of the questions from the audience. Uh, who are some players from the pre-analytics age of the NBA that you think would be considered far more valuable now than they were considered then? I think, Daryl, that's probably a question for you. No, I think Jeff. Jeff. Fat Lever. What's that? Fat Lever? Fat Lever. I, I think he was a... Uh, triple-double guy, right? He's a triple -double he was a But it was just, he, he, I think he impacted the game. But also style of play. 
uh, jumps your numbers up too. So back then, Denver played faster mm -hmm. uh, than most teams, and but he was a terrific player, and I don't think he was a household name at all. Daryl, you have one. I don't have a specific. I would say just in general, like the the very defensive-minded centers in the past that that weren't offensive players. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think are shown to be more valuable. You know, it's interesting you say that. The first like the Kembe is a good example. Right. Yeah. The Mark first Eaton. purr that um, Eaton, yeah. Hollinger ever did. You know, the first when he started that whole thing, which he's a brilliant guy. He had all-time best centers based on that. Bill Russell was like sixth. Oh yeah. Because he didn't fired. Score. <laughs> I was like, who is this yeah, guy? <laughs> but that's when we he's he's say, yeah. well, bucking that's the I mean. narrative. He's not, yeah. Yeah, well, that's, that's why the numbers, yeah. the numbers can't be singular. Well, they didn't even keep blocks back then. So like, yeah, that's know. a small part of yeah, Russell's yeah, game. So. Tiny bit. Yeah. Okay. I think he's done that. I've seen a bunch of pictures. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How much of an advantage do teams like Golden State and Milwaukee have in being able to avoid defensive switches in their long lineups? Shane, you can answer that one. What was it? Yeah, repeat the question. Sure. See, you didn't know I was going to ask you, did you? They're doing a lot of perimeter switching, Golden yeah. State. Yeah. They're just wondering if that's a, Milwaukee. a new you know, advantage. Well, I like to switch situationally. Um, I think in the NBA, Jeff, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if, if you give a steady diet of any one look to any team, teams are too good and Scott's good too good, good team, yeah. they're, they're going to figure out a way to, to beat it. And right. so the switch is no different. Uh, when you have length on the perimeter and you can get away with switching, it's great, especially late in the game. It's, a, it's, a, it's an awesome change of pace, but I don't like any defense uh, too consistently. Teams are too good, they'll find a way to beat it. When we had you and uh, Trace McGrady and Ron for that one game, <laughs> we, we could switch a lot yeah, yeah. So, for the one yeah. game that you were all healthy that ba year. Bad, team, yeah. <laughs> bad teams can't beat switches, good teams can. But I would say, too, like just uh, the last game Houston played that I covered uh, against the Clippers, uh, Kevin McHale played bigger on Chris Paul, and then they started switching some pick-and-roll actions because DeAndre Jordan was hurting him on the roll, and I, I thought it had a impact. So I think switching to me, uh, what Milwaukee's doing, they're trying to get very long, similar size guys because the pick and roll has never been more dominant. This is where Mike D'Antoni, to me, revolutionized NBA basketball from a pace, spacing, and made it strictly a pick and roll game. There's nothing else being done in the NBA for the most part. Right. And so you can't just, as Shane said, you know, get over the screen, show. I mean, it's like, yeah, all right. Well, yeah, they got three-point shooting. They got these athletes now where they're throwing it up to the rim on lo uh, lobs off the roll. It's such a different game than it was 10 years ago. No question. Um, I like, I'd like to know this answer as well. What aspect of basketball would you like to see the next analytical innovation take place? My guess is it probably is already taking place behind the scenes, and you just haven't shared it with us. Would you care to share today, Daryl? <laughs> no. Um, it's all mostly on the defensive end. You know, it's going to find guys like Shane or maybe even more valuable. Okay. So, but yeah, there's a lot of good papers here this year Great. Uh, on, on defense. So using the sport view data. So I wanted to ask about the sport view data. We didn't get to that today. Uh, and for those of you It'll be covered many times in the future okay. panel. So. Okay, so yeah. we, we can let it go, I guess. But for, for those of you in the audience, this is the, the cameras that were mm -hmm. installed. Did you guys have them before the NBA installed them across yeah. the board? You yeah, did. You've did. had them for a while. Right? Yeah. And just give a, a brief synopsis of the real it's benefits just, of that. It's great. 25 times a second, you get a picture in three dimensions of all five players and the referees, although we don't get the referees anymore and the ball in, in three dimensions as well. And so really it's, 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 you know, it's the mother load of data. Like you, if you can dream it, you can do it now. Like you can really test anything. Is it just a visual for, for the spacing that you're looking for, the defense? You can do spacing, how close the defender is, how effective they, I mean, like you can, literally any question you can now answer, it's just time and money. Okay, so. okay, very good. Um, what current NBA player, and I'm going to ask you, Shane, what current NBA player is the closest match to Shane Battier, and how much is that player worth today on the market? Um, There's only one Shane Battier. Let's just let's start there. So I'm going to throw my Chris Middleton out there just to, you know. Uh, I'm going to say Draymond Green. Ah. Oh, okay. Um, Good one. Very talented player. He's awesome. And I, I, jumped, <laughs> I jumped up and down. 
Handsome. Handsome. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but does he have any green Just pants, though, has, has that certain yeah. je ne sais quoi, <laughs> you, you know. Have this, yeah, yeah. A uh, incredible career Draymond, after. Draymond Green. Yeah. And uh, now that I'm on the college side, I don't get to follow the numbers as closely in the NBA, but it just seems whenever he's on the floor, they're a better team. Would you and, have and made more money over your career if, if Michael Lewis's article came out? Yes. Yeah. So that's probably my biggest regret that you didn't come to my life <laughs> earlier, Michael. You wouldn't have talked to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the uh, Memphis guy on that bargain deal that we stole you on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and I was just happy. I was just happy to sign that deal. Yeah. So I, I actually read an article on ESPN.com who has just Kevin Pelton and just a, a bunch of guys that are just really talented with analytics. And they were talking about the all-in teams, the one-foot-in teams, the skeptics, and the, um, what are you making a yeah, face for? Yeah, I'm not I, even done I, I, yet. I'm going to say that. I read that too. Yeah. And there's nothing that has ever repulsed me more <laughs> than that. Because it's like we're, it's like we have this church of analytics. Yes, exactly And you right. have to. I'm a devoted no, follower. No, no, I understand that. I'm in. Yeah. I mean, it's like, no, it's, it, 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 it's gone. Like the Lakers. Where are you, Jeff? Uh, this guy, uh, some guy. He's uh, one foot in. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm all in, but I, like, this guy um, just wrote a scathing article about the Lakers yesterday. Right, right. I mean, just took them apart. And I'm like, is this the same team that has the most championships <laughs> that got that got Kobe Bryant in the trade, Shaquille O'Neal in free agency. Well, they're also Magic not trying Johnson. to win right now. They're trying no, but, to get their top five protected picks. So that's but, but I'm just saying, like, we have something we can judge everything on. It's called the standings. Right. It's called the standings. And now, now I, I give the analytic people that community credit because if you lose, it's called a plan. <laughs> and if you win, if you win, <laughs> then, then that's, awesome. that's a plan too. So you can't lose. Yeah. So you're like brilliant if you lose or you win. All right, and then we can this. just say the coach screwed up the talent. <laughs> and if you, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant, no, I'm saying this is brilliant. They got every, they got all the writers in their back pockets. They got, they got like, you're scorned if you don't say like, you know, you're old school, like, you actually believe in hard work. Oh, shit. I mean, you know, I mean. All right, let me ask you this. I, I've been dying to ask you this, all I mean, you guys I mean, that today. guy, uh, the owner of San, uh, Sac was Sacramento, saying that he back, won yeah. a girls' championship with no talent just by <laughs> pressing. Grade, I'm grade. like, are you kidding me? I coach fourth grade girls' basketball this year. It's all about players. So I call <laughs> bullshit on that. And... And, like, the, the two keys in fourth grade girls basketball are this, Jackie. Can you make a layup, okay? And do all your players show up? Because if all 10 show up, you have to play them equally. But if you can convince two that they're really sick, like, hey, hey, Martha, you're sick today. You don't look well. Go home. That means your two best players play three quarters. That's how you win in fourth grade girls basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Tremendous. I do want to ask you one thing. So last year on this stage, Phil Jackson made a very good case for the fact that he was interested in analytics and had been using analytics since the Chicago Bulls and all that. The New York Knicks right now are the team that takes the most mid-range jump shots in the league. And we know that that's the worst shot in basketball, analytically speaking. Does the triangle sync with analytics? I mean, assume it does. And again, I don't want to judge this Knicks team on really anything because this is not the team that will exist going forward. Well, I, I think the, the mid-range jumper part of the plan. Is, is the triangle. Yeah, it's the plan. Right. Um, is, <laughs> is the triangle is a mid-range jump Well, that's shooting. why I'm asking. But no, no, I don't agree a, with that, Joe. Let me but we'll get back to the finish. Yeah. But it's a post-up. You need to get to the free throw line. What the Knicks right. don't do is they shoot two-point jump shots, don't get to the free throw line. His great teams got to the free throw line, and they, the ball was in the post. Yeah, they went to the rim, too. Yeah, sure. so the, and the ball was like living. Listen, it's not really, you know, you got to get Hall of Fame players and then surround yeah. them with the right players. As Coach McHale said, if you have great players, you can run the, the square. Yeah. yeah it, doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. We it used doesn't to call matter. it triangle 23, <laughs> yeah. you know, because... That triangle with Jordan on the floor, what, that, if they would have had plus minus back then, he was a plus. And, and if he wasn't on there, they out. were a minus. Yeah, so it's. All right. 
All right, thank you, Michael Lewis, Jeff Van Gundy, Shane Batty, Daryl Morey. That was fun. I was, I was curious how you did.